Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here and you begin to enjoy what you are listening to, please consider hitting that subscribe button and also set that notification bell to all so you don't miss any stories I upload, which tend to be daily. If you are interested in the membership of Back to Ashes or would like to tip me with a cup of coffee, all the information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Ouija Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I have never been into paranormal stuff because I've had enough activity happen to me over the year. Over this last summer, my friends and I decided it was a good idea to make our own Ouija board and play it at their house and also at the cemetery. They asked it stuff like I knew was true and they didn't. Right there, I could sense it was a real thing. Then, out of curiosity, my friend Kay goes, will our friend P be pregnant at age 19? And it said yes. Flash forward a few months later and get a phone call from P saying she is actually pregnant. And in that moment, I have never been so awestruck and freaked out at the same time. Nothing like that has ever worked. And now I'm a little more freaked out because I know the board works. I cannot believe that it came true and that the board predicted something insane like that. I am kind of excited about the other stuff we ask it, but also very leery of it too. Okay, so my mom told me this time when she was about 15 or 16, and her and her friends at the time loved to try new creepy stuff out to entertain themselves. One night, my mom and her friends played light as a feather, stiff as a board with seven people. One person laid down while the other six sat around her with only two fingers of each person under the girl laying down. One of the girls had to make up a story about how the girl laying down dies. They used past tense just in case. And then they had a chant, a certain phrase. I think it was light as a feather, stiff as a board, light as a feather, stiff as a board. While lifting the girl, my mom said it worked and they lifted their friend at least five inches off the ground. It scared the girls shitless because the girl being lifted said it felt like she was paralyzed and couldn't breathe. They all ended up freaking out and dropped her. After they played that, they decided it was a great idea to play with a homemade Ouija board. My mom refused to tell me what the board ended up saying. But she said as soon as the activity on the board started, the rocking chair in the living room would not stop rocking. She even went over and physically stopped it. And as soon as she let it go again, she told me, she was so scared she ended up throwing the chair outside and smashing it to bits. So I'm pretty sure the majority of us have used or know someone who has used a Ouija board. Feel free to tell me about your experiences. I'm going to tell you one of my worst ones. I was young probably around 16, 17. It was the middle of the summer, so I had a lot of free time on my hands. After a long day of playing outside with my friends, I decided to invite a handful over to my house. My mom was out of town all night, and so it was the perfect time to try out the Ouija board. 
I was thinking about doing it for a while now, and I've always been curious on the subject. Paranormal stuff. Anyway, I'll get to it. The Ouija board is all set up, and we start to use it. All of my friends didn't seem to take it as serious as I was. All laughing and joking around, you know, that sort of thing. But, after using it for around five minutes, we get in contact with a spirit. She was five years old. Russian. Her name was Avama. She spelt it out. It got a little tense, and my friends started to take it a little bit more serious. Except, one. My best friend. He just didn't believe anything that was happening. Then, after a few more minutes, the door opened in the room we were using. The girls got a little too freaked out, but we continued to play. After talking to the spirit for around 10 minutes, we found out she's not the only one in the house there. And there were 19 others. She said we let them in. It got a little tiring for some people, so we decided to wrap it up. One of my friends just lifted her finger and left the room. I told her that she shouldn't have done that. We need to do it properly. She shrugged her shoulders and left the room. This is where the more interesting stuff happened. I asked the spirit if we could leave the board. It said no. She was scared for some reason. We tried to leave, but she just refused us every time. My best friend, out of the blue, raised his voice and started to shout things like, Let us leave, you twat. You're not even fucking real. If you were real, you would show yourself. All of a sudden, we heard a bang within the room we were all in. The door slammed shut, and we all sat there shook. I look over to my right side and I noticed a facial imprint starting to appear within the glass window. I pointed it out so I knew I wasn't the only one seeing it. Everyone else saw the facial imprint. They all saw it, and everyone left the room screaming except me and my best friend. I tried to rub this facial imprint away from inside and outside, but it would not disappear. I freaked and ran out because at that moment, it all felt way too real. We left the house and got out there, hearing all sorts of noises on the way out, from voices saying, Get out! Leave! Go! And there were bangs everywhere. That night, I couldn't stay at home, so I slept at my friend's. Probably not the most scariest thing to happen when using a Ouija board, but it was for me. Please, I'd love to hear your opinions. I've lived in a few haunted houses growing up, and I used to play a lot of Ouija. I grew up with a mother who was totally into anything paranormal, so naturally it rubbed off on me. I'll share an experience I had when I was 18. One place we lived in was more of a cottage than a house. It was out in the country down a long dirt driveway, and it was like a main section of the house with two bedrooms, my room and my sister's room. Then it had two additional rooms added on. One on the side, brother's room, and one at the back of the house, mom's room, of course. One night, my sister and I were playing with our homemade Ouija. We had cut out every letter of the alphabet and arranged them in order and wrote yes, no, hello, and goodbye, and would use a shot glass as our planchette. And we made contact with a ghost who identified itself as Fred. I was using a pencil to jot down all the letters the glass was pointing to, when all of a sudden, the pencil was just gone. Checked under the table and around the kitchen, where we were sitting, and haven't moved from since we started. So, I decided to ask the Ouija where the pencil was, and it responded by saying, It's in my mom's room. Now, I was always afraid of her room, 
It always felt like something was watching you from the doorway, which was actually just at the end of the hall that was connected to the kitchen where we were sitting. Then the Ouija spelled out, Go get it. I rebuttal and say, Hell no, I'm not going in there. Then it kept spelling out, Go, go, go. I asked why it wanted me to go in there so badly, and it spelt something along the lines of, Cause I want to kill you. Uh, I did not want to look like a wimp, so I said, Well, if you kill me, then you'll be stuck with me in the afterlife, and I will mess with you for the rest of eternity. Which is basically a provocation. Something you should never do with spirits unless you want some kind of backlash, which I got. Not so sure Fred liked that because we couldn't get the Ouija to talk to us after that. The next morning, everyone left to go about their daily business, and I was at home alone, sleeping in because it was my day off work. While I was still kind of sleeping in my creepy-ass room with no windows, like half in a dream but half aware of my surroundings, I could hear two people talking about blankets. I thought it was my mom and sister. I heard them say, take the blankets, he's sleeping. Then I felt my blankets get pulled off of me, which totally woke me up. I opened my eyes and realized I couldn't move. I was stuck in sleep paralysis. I could no longer hear the voices. All I could do was move my eyes. I tried to scream and couldn't. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw something glowing. I moved my eyes to where I saw it, and there was this big, round, pale white face floating beside my bed, staring at me. I was so scared, I felt a tear come out of my eye. It was there, staring at me, while I stared back at it in terror for at least 10 seconds. All the while, I'm still freaking paralyzed. Then, its black eyes just blinked and it floated up into the corner of the room and just disappeared. The second it was gone, I regained all of my motor functions and snapped out of bed and just ran outside to go get out of this house. A couple of days later, I was up late watching TV in the living room which was attached to my room, my brother's room, and my sister's room, which all had doors on opposite sides of the walls of the living room, while my mom was in her room, sleeping, and my siblings were all gone out. I'm just sitting there, a little on edge, because the house was extra scary after the first experience. Then, next thing you know, I hear this loud crash, bang, boom, come from my sister's room, which was right beside the chair I was sitting in. I jumped up and screamed and ran to the middle of the living room. I stare at my sister's door, half expecting it to open and some wild animal would come barging through and attack me. But nothing happened. Not five seconds later, I hear the same kind of crash, bang, boom, come from my brother's room. I ran to my mom's room to wake her up so I could make her check what the fuck was making all these banging noises in our rooms. Not the proudest moment. I stood behind her while she first opened my sister's door and I was thinking maybe a raccoon or something had gotten in there. We look inside and realize that a few of the ceiling tiles were torn out from different sections of the ceiling and laying around her room, one being on her bed and two on the floor, all about five feet from one another. I'm like, okay, it's an old creepy house. Maybe an animal was up there and knocked them down somehow. I go, okay. So, what happened in my brother's room then? We go look, and his ceiling was also on the floor. His ceiling was made up of insulation and plywood that was screwed into the roof stud. The plywood somehow became detached and fell down. Now, what are the odds of two different sections of the same house that were not attached to each other in any way 
made up of two different building materials on a rainless summer night having their ceilings fall down. What other explanation could there be other than me thinking I'm being a badass by calling on a ghost and within the next few days having these strange events happening? So, I warn people who think they're tough or brave or whatever, do not tell a creepy ghost named Fred who said he wants to kill you that you met on a Ouija board you were playing in the creepy-ass house you live in, out in the boonies, that you're going to mess with him for all of eternity. Or you just might end up regretting it, like I did. Over ten years ago, I opened up a portal in my life, which I may never understand or lose. There are still days I feel the presence, and I believe I will be perpetually followed by a manifestation of my own actions. Even recently, I've begun having a weird habit of almost psychosis-like uncontrollable dark thinking. Just go kill yourself repeated over the course of just a few days in my head, last month more than 50 times. This happened for things as large as depressive wallowing or as small as forgetting to do something. I unconsciously formed devil horns on my hands every day. I have a strange obsession with occult imagery and the enlightened eye of Lucifer that you may or may not notice propagated literally everywhere in me. Where's the best place to hide the truth? Right in plain sight. When I was in high school, I was overweight and drawn to outsider extremist type of crowds. We wore black, we listened to death metal, and we caused as much general mayhem as possible, all the while toting a pack of Parliament cigarettes like we were Bill Ballo halfway through his daily fifth of Jack. In these times, there was one group which I grew to like, trust, and ultimately subject my innocence and soul. My friends introduced me to the Ouija board as something they really wanted to delve into. When I was persuaded, we didn't just delve, we dove. I turned away from my Catholic upbringing and began to search for evil so that we could translate that to our experience with the board. This was because our first few plays were typical of a new Ouija user's experience. The board moved very little. We questioned who was even moving it in the first place, and we had exhausted our haunted venues. I introduced a satanic mantra to the group, and it was welcomed to the table inside of my friend Cody's house. We were getting tired of the effort it took to get into graveyards and abandoned buildings, so his dad's place was going to have to do. We put the board on his kitchen table, huddled around it with our hands on the plane jet, and chanted the mantra. Archangel, dark angel, lend me thy light through death's bell until we have heaven in sight. Six times, pause. Six times, pause. Six times. What a bad idea. What an ignition of torment. These are the events as followed from our many experiences with the board after that with the house that we cursed and what I've dealt with since then. The board became a hub of life. No matter who touched it, no matter how light we tried to touch it, the board would speak in volumes at a very rapid rate. It would always spell words in their entirety to form whole sentences correctly in English and strafe in and out of wonderment and vulgar slandering. For example, the board told me in 2006 that Obama was going to be president of the United States. 
This was before any decisions were even made in his own party. It also told me that by 2012, the world will have been destroyed by his actions. It spoke at length about salvation, pointing out that certain friends were to die early and suffer. Those of faith like myself and very little of my cohorts were to possibly see salvation if we changed certain aspects of our life. And yes, it laid our deepest fears of why we wouldn't be able to see it happen on the table for the rest of our friends to read. For example, it told me that I needed to stop with premarital sex or I would have no chance. My biggest worry at the time, how did it know? It also admittedly swore there were friends of mine who were doomed to burn for the rest of eternity, who had no chance of heaven no matter what they did. You see, we knew what we were looking to find, what to talk to, a demon or a well-known entity of evil, from classic Lucifer to Anton Levy and Aleister Crowley, and it manifested in various ways through the board. They told us that the greatest part about hell was being a slave. The worst part about hell was being a slave. Cody loved the adrenaline and ended up buying a new board. With this board, we went even further. This is something hard to fess up to and even harder to allude to in a confessional as a Catholic to a respected priest, but I still do it in light of my soul and personal beliefs. With the new board, I found a backward recording of the Lord's Prayer and let it rip. Oh, the movement. The board would lift between the answers, yes and no, faster than we could think it to stop. It also became more evil and malevolent in its answering. One day, we invited a host of extra friends. They were friends I knew. We began with the usual questions that shouldn't know the answer to. Flipping it off and watching the board spell back, fuck you too. And when they had witnessed the power of what we had invoked, a friend named Jordan started to lose his cool. No way this is real. You have to be moving it, dude. He exclaimed in disbelief. Acting all pompous, know-it-all, he took the Bible he had brought for his own peace of mind and plopped it onto the table. Immediately, the planchette sprung into action with one of the most memorable things the board has ever communicated. Take the Bible off the table or else I'll burn the house down, you fuckers. It spelled every single letter, and we all went nuts. Of course, the house did not burn down after Jordan refused to remove the Bible, but it has gotten us in other ways. Cody's house became a bona fide place of the strange. Like I said, I had many groups, and this one was full of needy people that mooched off of each other. That being said, there was a constant stirring of people coming and going and passing out on couches and acting like the place was theirs. Cody's dad worked out of town 90% of the time, and that was taken advantage of. One of the kids that always stayed there, who played with us regularly, stopped wanting to be over there because he would constantly see a staunch white face that would glare at him through the windows. Cody saw little sheep in that house and would wake up in living nightmares, he said. For example, one sleep he awoke in the midst of the night. 3 a.m. is a real supernatural hour and felt extremely uneasy. Soon he began to hear haunting moans, which culminated in a mass of hands reaching up and over the bed as if they were going to grab him and pull him into Hades itself. A good friend of mine, who I stupidly introduced, had the worst visible reaction of any one of us. We finished a session, 
and were cruising around in my car to rehash the experience. Midway through this, he stops talking to me. I pause for an answer, and in my waiting, I hear an odd breathing. He turned out to be basically panting like a dog. I pull over and go out to go to the side. He was positioned leaning downward in the passenger seat, but had also had one arm up holding the oh shit handle. It was as if he was glued to it, panting and panting. I could only think of how strange and stupid his behavior was. When I started to try and help by touching him to get out of the car, he only panted harder. I began to think it couldn't be a joke. This scared the shit out of me, so I drove five minutes across our small town to the Catholic church. I had no idea what to do, but I had an inkling. I pulled him out of the car and basically spilled him into the sidewalk of the church, right in front of a statue of the Virgin Mary. He writhed on the pavement, but eventually came to and was extremely disoriented. To this day, I don't know if he was playing a joke on me or if that was real, but it did something to frighten the hell out of me. In this time, I noticed that I became more withdrawn and spiteful. I hated my classmates and wanted nothing to do with the popular and liked people in our school. I began to research the occult and download literature from respected names and evil, such as the aforementioned Alistair, Anton, and H.P. Lovecraft. One day, my mother came down into my room in the basement. She didn't say much, but I could tell she was deeply disconcerted. Whatever it is you have brought into my house, take it out now. My dreams have become haunted and evil, and I know that it has been you. I never told her anything of what I was doing, but my actions had begun to cause her deeply uncomforting nightmares. It was right at this time I had my first episode of sleep paralysis. One night I woke up and I could not move. I tried to lift an arm and roll over and even scream. I couldn't get any part of my body to respond. I tried to force all of my will and thought into something as simple as just moving a pinky. Nothing. This was similar to my further research into typical sleep paralysis experiments others have had. An oppressing feeling, hearing things and seeing what's not there. I saw no figures, but I did have an out-of-body experience. Almost lucid dreaming type of experience, if you will. While I was laying there, I sort of lost touch with reality and my physical body. I remember sitting up but also being conscious that I had never moved and that my body was still laying in bed. While sitting, my soul I guess, turned towards the doorway to the basement room I lived in. I gazed across the floor to the doorway where through that should have been a set of seven stairs that led straight up and out of the basement. I couldn't make out the doorway. I couldn't make it out the stairs. That area of the room, to me, was a pitch black hole, a moving, breathing black cloud. Around me, the hue of the room was a light twilight like gray, so it was easy to see that where the doorway should have been was not what was there at all. I felt supreme fear, but I still stared. When I finally turned back to sitting forward and laid down flat, I was suddenly able to move my body again, like someone gasping back to life after receiving CPR. I deleted all the occult literature I had downloaded the next day. Fast forward three years, and I'm a teenager of Gonzaga University as a freshman. It was a great time, but to stay relevant, it was also a time I grew to expect haunting nightmares of my own. More than once, I would wake up in my bed as if it were me actually waking up. But immediately, 
I would notice that the crucifix in the room, which I never had, would be hanging crooked, not just awkwardly, but at a hard, almost right angle. I knew that a crucifix that doesn't hang straight is a indication of a supernatural presence. I would get up feeling anxious and wanting to connect with someone else to know what was going on. Whenever I found my friends or loved ones in these dreams, the same occurrence would take place. They would express deep concern for me and approach me to see what was wrong. But when I exposed my face and tried to speak, it would come out as the deepest, most inhuman bellow. Imagine the MGM lion's growl for whatever I was trying to say. When this happened in my dreams, my friends and family would literally fall over themselves in horror, trying to get away from me. When I was abandoned and longing, my dream self would be flung to my back and I would experience an unnatural pressure on my chest. Whether this is a possessing experience or part of my nightmares, I don't know, but I've had this type of dream at least five times in my life now. Throughout the years, I feel a presence that follows me and it haunts me whenever I turn to God or strive to become involved in a holier lifestyle. There was a climactic time for me in 2014 where all of my past flooded back to become a renewed source of haunting. I accidentally ingested a foot spray that was very toxic in my apartment and almost passed out from this. I was lightheaded, disoriented, and far from all there, putting me in a very vulnerable state. I was also scared that I may pass out and never wake up, so I jumped into the car to get myself to the hospital come hell or high water. A trip to the hospital meant that I needed my insurance card, which was at work. I remember only feeling hazy on the drive there. For some reason, I swore that card was there and that I just had to have it for the ER. I pulled up right outside of the building and went into the lobby to call the elevator. At the time, I worked for one of the largest real estate firms in the state as an agent. My broker was a micromanaging freak, so the office was made up of many offices in one large space. The catch was that each individual office was made up of all glass walls. Our broker just had to be able to make sure everyone was always working. What that meant for me during my delusional visit was that the office was full of bright lights from passing cars on the road twinkling like a kaleidoscope setting in the right light. This was extremely disconcerting. I found my desk, almost frightened from the silent and twinkling office, and dug through where I thought I had put my card. It wasn't there. Could I have doubled myself and left it in my car this whole time? Around that time, I had this revelation. I felt a most threatening presence growing behind me in the corner of the room. I turned just in time to see a mass of unstoppable black which seemed to be growing to envelop my body and a feeling of hate directed toward me. I tripped over myself out of that office. I didn't shut any of the doors, my desk, the hall, the exit, and ran out. I knew the front door locked itself, so I didn't even think twice about it. The last thing I heard on the way out was the hall door upstairs clicking innocently shut. I made it to the hospital and was nursed back to health. At this time, my romantic long-distance relationship went sour. I knew she was going behind my back and this caused a huge part of our downfall. But another portion came from what she claimed to hear and feel. She was more than a hundred miles away, but was haunted by dragging sounds outside of her room and evil inside the house. 
One night, she called me and asked if I were home. I was at home myself, far away. She was freaking out about the dragging around in her living room, which I couldn't claim responsibility for or explain. She was talking to me when all of a sudden, I lost her on the other end of the phone. I could still hear her breathing, but she disappeared for minutes. Then she was back, whimpering and had been gone long enough to freak me out. She even went as far as to have the house blessed with sage by a medium. This was completely against my Catholic upbringing, and it almost killed my cat because of how outlandishly he reacted trying to exit the house through a screen window during the process that was five feet in the air. The medium, in their first encounter, told her that I am haunted because of what I have done in my past. I had never told her about my Ouija experience before. She was extremely judgmental and closed-minded. From that experience, she came to me asking questions about things she had no business knowing, like satanic music that had taken its toll, that there was a certain lyric that I had heard that had brought this upon me. I knew exactly what it was. It was our satanic mantra. I still try to make it to church. I'm in a relationship in which I'm in love now, and none of this matters because I am supported and feel strength in many aspects. I still confess to my Ouija use in the confessional, and I wish for it to go away. Will it return again to haunt me? It's hard to deny a trend of darkness, even though the greatest efforts to return to the light. Disclaimer. This is all personal experience. There's nothing made up or embellished here because it's not necessary. That being said, this is written from an all but psychological experience, as you have read. Nothing extraordinary or outlandish is described physically. Follow up. The night I recalled this and wrote this memory in its entirety three years ago, police and paramedics came into my house at 3 a.m. My brother's drunk friend got paranoid, had a panic attack, and called 911 when they got home and while I was sleeping. Coincidence again? Beware of the cult. Hello everyone. This is the first time I'm telling this story. I hope to get some help, and I'll try to explain my situation as well as possible. Please ask if anything is unclear. A short background to my life. I've always been a relatively normal girl. I've always had friends. I'm just about to finish a higher education. I never had financial problems. I've never been seriously ill. Things just always went on smooth with my life, more or less. I never believed in the paranormal, but things that has happened to me this past year have made me doubt. I'll start from the beginning. I'll try to only share the most necessary information since I don't want to put myself in this position again. About a year ago, me and my boyfriend spent a night alone in a pretty big house. We were sick of watching TV and movies, so we decided to think of something different to do. The other night, we had been watching a horror movie about a Ouija board, and we had been talking about that none of us have ever tried one. Since neither of us believed in the paranormal, we decided to try it just for fun. We were kind of silly about the whole thing, making it something romantic instead of something very serious. We turn off all the lights in the house, and I decide to grab a piece of paper to make the board. I googled a picture of the board and copied it. My boyfriend turned on some candles, and I did a quick Google on how to go about this whole thing. As I remember it, I just clicked on the first link and read that we should take a glass, place it on the board, 
and with a finger on it. We should make the infinity sign for ten times and then stop. I think I stopped my research there somewhere, so this was all we did. We were sitting opposite of each other, and we started asking some questions. Nothing happened for about 10 to 15 minutes. We were holding our fingers on the glass. The mood kind of left us, and my boyfriend started to get a bit silly. The weather outside was pretty bad this night, and the wind made a sound in the house wall outside. At this point, my boyfriend started laughing and saying, it's probably Zozo. Zozo, is that you? He remembered this name from the movie we had just watched. I laughed at his efforts to scare me, and I also said something regarding this. I do remember saying the name Zozo out loud. We had lost the mood at this point, and we started talking about doing something else. We just removed our fingers from the glass and started cleaning up. I took the paper of the board and started folding it because I didn't want the house owners to see it in the trash can. It was not our house, by the way. And in the last moment, I decided to bring it into our room instead and put it in our personal trash. Just because I was a bit embarrassed by the whole thing and wanted to make sure that no one saw it. The evening went on and eventually we went to bed. The next morning, I was about to start cleaning our room a bit, and I came across the paper of the board. It was clean and open. The folding I had made the other day was gone. I asked my boyfriend about it, but he didn't take it seriously, again laughing and saying, <laughs> maybe Zozo wanted to talk to you more. I grabbed the paper and looked at it and in the corner where the word yes was written, the text was smeared out like we had spilled water on it or something. I couldn't remember us spilling anything on this paper. We had a glass of wine when we were doing this, but this was no wine stain. It looked more like water had been spilt on it. We forgot about the whole thing and moved on with our lives. I didn't think about the whole thing until last month. The thing is that, after this session, my life has changed. A lot. And only for the worst. I don't want to give you any details, but I can give you an overview. My studies, that always went well, started going incredibly bad. I started losing relationships. My relationship to my partner almost broke apart. I got very, very bad financial problems. Everything that had always worked out for me just stopped completely working. In addition, more or less, everything that could possibly go wrong for me did, in fact, go wrong. To the point where people around me have started asking me where all of this bad luck is coming from. I take it pretty seriously when other people start to see things like that since humans tend to feel more sorry for themselves than others do. I think you know what I mean by this. Bad habits I had have increased intensity, and this bad luck I have is insane. Every tiny, tiny thing that can possibly go wrong just goes wrong. I'm often sick. You just have to take my word on this. This past year has been the worst in my life for a normal person. The things happening to me just should not be happening. We have a dog that very often just barks into nothing in our home. My boyfriend is often making jokes saying that we have a ghost. The other month, I decided to think about this a bit more and I googled it a bit. As I now understand it, we did a lot of things wrong that night, and I do mean a lot, especially when saying the name Zozo out loud so many times. I also started remembering that thing about the piece of paper, the board. It was just very, very strange since I so clearly remember that I was folding it to 
hide the text in the trash. We also didn't finish it up correctly. We just stopped. I have never been open to these things, but this bad luck in my life has gone so far that I'm open to anyone telling me the Ouija board session we had has something to do with it. Worth mentioning is that my partner also experienced this to a certain extent. Things having been happening to him too, but not as much. It's mostly me. Since I don't have a lot of knowledge about this, I'm turning to you. Could it be possible that something is attached to me? What could I do? I don't know how long I can take this. This has to stop. Please, give me all of your thoughts and tips. I would really appreciate it. I hope sharing this with you is a safe space. Anyway, I was 16. It was summer and the age before the internet and cell phones. 1988. So, boredom was a real thing. My friend B and I were getting into new age stuff, but apparently crossed the line when we found a leather-bound red book on witchcraft. From it, we learned how to make a magic circle with a knife on the bedroom floor. Then we used the top wood piece from my desk. It slid out as a Ouija board base. We even followed the directions in the book and painted on the numbers and letters with green paint. That was supposed to make a difference. I used watercolors. I'm not stupid. Didn't want to ruin my desk. We used an upside-down plastic margarine container as a planchette for the spirits to move around. We balanced it between us as we sat Indian-style in the middle of the circle. We put our fingers on it, one finger from each hand. As soon as we touched it, it started zooming around the board. My friend squealed and took her hands off. I did not, and I know I wasn't pushing it around. So, we asked a lot of things. What I remember most was how it told me some things about my mother's death I didn't know. I confirmed these details later, as soon as I turned 18 and was able to access the public records from the investigation. We asked a lot of questions about what boys liked us and stupid stuff like that. But I was the only one who would keep touching it. So later, after cleaning up the desk piece and hiding the book, I start to get a really bad headache and I can't hold down food. I stay in bed for a week and half-heartedly eating. I lost 15 pounds, which rocked, by the way. The whole time I'm laying in the dark room, I saw with my mind's eye a demon crouched on the dresser at the foot of my bed. It looked like a gremlin with glowing red eyes and burned-looking skin. It just grinned at me. Eventually, my dad, a physician, decides I am dangerously ill and actually need medical treatment. So, I get admitted to the hospital. I was terribly weak, dehydrated, and my head had never stopped hurting. After a spinal tap, they told me that I had viral meningitis. I stayed a few days with IVs and such. Because it was such a virus, I had to wait it out. I barely lived through it. A few weeks later, I'm back home, but so weak, I can't walk across the house without having to rest on the way there. I'm constantly hunched over and can't stand straight. The same friend, B., came by and reminded me was the psychic fair put on by the local New Age store and would have tarot card readers and various vendors and such. We'd been planning on going all summer. I warn her we can't stay long because I am so weak, but she's cool with that, and so we go over. As soon as I walk in, a lady screeches, Oh my God! 
she rushes over to me, and I get surrounded by the psychic readers and healers. Several were freaking out. The one that screeched tells me I have a demon in my back and proceeds to do an aura clearing right then and there. She said to imagine golden bubbles were flowing over my head. Then she took her hand and swept it around me, close to my skin but not touching me. She did this all over, head to the floor and all around me, and then I felt claws rip out of my back. All of a sudden, I could stand up straight, and I felt completely better. Apparently, she cleansed me in white light. Incidentally, I've imitated her actions with friends later who had had bad headaches, and their headaches would go away. She didn't ask for money, and I didn't even think about paying her. She and the others seemed pretty shaken up and aghast when we told them the whole story. Supposedly, what I had done was open a channel with no protection or proper guidance, and a dark entity took advantage. I read tarot now, and am very careful. I know it's hard to believe, and yes, I'm open to questions. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Ouija stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Samantha Play, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Anita B., Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's Niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all for remaining to be the pillars of on which Back to Ashes stands. I really do appreciate you. And to the other subscribers and listeners, thank you so much for your support. For without you, I would not have a voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.